Suzanne West is a professor of psychology at John F. Kennedy University, and she teaches in the BA psychology program and also uh, the program in consciousness and uh, transformative and consciousness studies. Suzanne is um, the um, author. Oh, and I wanted to mention that she received the, um, I think it's the Harry L. Morrison Award for Distinguished Teaching uh, at JFK. She is really a remarkable teacher. She's also the author of a seminal text um, titled Soul Care for Caregivers, How to Care for Yourself, How to Help Yourself While Helping Others. I say this is a seminal text because I think this is really the locus classicus for caregivers, whether they're lay or professional. And I actually think uh, it should be required reading every medical school in the country. It has that kind of quality. And she ran a program, a wonderful program, called Soul Care for Caregivers uh, with the help of the Symington Foundation. She is an integrative life coach. She is the founder and facilitator of a, I'm not sure what exactly uh, to call it, but it's Seamless Being. That's the title. And it's a non-dual approach toward awakening and transformation. And, uh, you know, I was speaking of embodying our highest values earlier today. Suzanne, for me, uh, embodies the kind of presence which by itself can be such a powerful healing agent. So please welcome Suzanne West. So um, the topic that I chose for the talk today um, is called Soul Gift, the Rewards of Caregiving. And before I launch into this material, which is really looking at caregiving as a soul event, as a gateway to potentially very deep, profound transformation, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But first, I wanted to just speak a little bit about the book and how it came to be. Um, it came directly out of um, my personal experience as a caregiver with my daughter. In 89, she was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis and Crohn's disease, which are two very debilitating, very painful illnesses. And, um, when we got the diagnosis and before, I was already becoming more and more consumed with caregiving, including constantly doing research to look at alternative cures and allopathic cures and just trying to manage for myself and within our family the family dynamics that were disrupted, the pain that she was living in. So it was um, extremely difficult for me. And um, about probably about two years into it, um, a very good friend took me aside and said, Suzanne, you don't see what's happening to you. You are so consumed with this and you're losing yourself. You're losing your resilience and your equanimity. And if you don't turn this around, she was very firm, if you don't turn this around, and start focusing on yourself again, taking care of yourself, you're going to be of no use to Heidi. And she said, if you can't do this for yourself, do it for Heidi. And as soon as she said that, and she was very firm with me, and a light bulb went off, and I got the truth of it, and I started seeing how run down I really was, and how I was not going to be able to help Heidi unless I took care of myself. So that represented for me a real turning point. So I began really not just finding processes and going back to my creativity and being social again and having some fun, but I really started studying um, what self-care really means. And I was investigating boundaries and creative expression as a wonderful tool for self-care. Many, many things, and I was interested not just for my own experience, but because I was watching 
myself become more resilient. I, I knew that I was discovering things that would be of benefit to other, both professional and family caregivers. So um, then I was uh, very fortunate to receive a grant from the Simonton Foundation, thank you, Marian, thank you, Toby, to help me bring this work. Initially, it was in the cancer community, um, and I did a lot of workshops, um, and then the book came out of that work. Um, so I was trying to think about um, a good topic for today rather than just kind of talk about nuts and bolts, about self-care, mm -hmm. That's so readily available. Um, just Google it, and you'll <laughs> get all <laughs> kinds of expertise about it. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go out on an edge a little bit, like I do when I bring what I'm going to talk about today um, in this talk. And I'm going to talk about the gifts of caregiving. And um, one thing I'd like you to know about me is that I am in no way a Pollyanna type. Um, I'm very wary of spiritual bypass. Um, I cringe when I can see someone and hear about someone hearing about a tragedy and then instantly jumping over the very difficult human feelings that should accompany encountering a tragedy and start talking about the rainbows about it and the light. And it's the, this is sometimes called the flight to light. So I'm very much about integration. And in the face of something as challenging as caregiving, especially when it's someone that you love, um, I believe it is just as important to allow for the full range of human feelings, fear, rage, anger, frustration, um, as well as being able to include the spiritual perspective. So I, um, I wanted to say that, and even though I'm going to be talking about the gifts of it, the kind of like the bright side, um, but that in no way negates the importance of fully embracing the human experience. I like to think about myself and um, you know, from my vantage point, I think about imminence, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E, -E, transcendence. In other words, we are embodied, we're finite, we're human, we are the personal, and at one and the same time, we are also infinite, transcendent. We are both personal, we are transpersonal. And so that's a lot of where I come from, is how do we negotiate that? How, how do we fully embrace the great messiness? And it's all around us now. It's global. How do we embrace all the feelings that we have about adversity and at the same time stay dialed into whatever your language is, soul, spirit, source, the divine, Christ consciousness? How do we hold it all? So. Um, I knew when I was teaching my workshops that it was going to be edgy to be sitting there in rooms with a, a lot of family caregivers, some professional caregivers, and introduce this topic. You know, I was teaching all kinds of other self-care practices and things around boundaries, but I knew because I had been around so many caregivers and I was very identified with just the dark side myself, I knew that this was going to push against some edges. And, um, and it did, you know. And I would sit in the room and I would say, so the topic of this section is the gifts of caregiving. I didn't water it down. And I didn't say the growth possibilities inherent in caregiving. <laughs> Um, and I did it intentionally. I, I wanted to be real because I had discovered that, which I'll talk about in a minute. And what I discovered in those rooms was that, yes, I would see some people rolling their eyes and other people folding their arms and gifts, you know. This is the most horrendous thing I've ever had to deal with in my life. You know, what kind of airy-fairy person is she? You know? and, um, but when I shared my experience from my heart, 
and, um, and then also included how the spiritual could be included for me in these horrendous things I had to walk through. I could see just little light bulbs starting to go off in the room and someone would raise their hand and say, oh my God, yes, you know, I have become such a strong person. I have faced what I've avoided and been afraid of my entire life. This really has changed me. And so, and then more and more people in the room. So I knew I was doing the right thing um, and that it was helpful to people. And I'd like to just share a little bit about how I came to that realization myself, how I was able to shift beyond just being identified um, as a victim, really, and as having this horrendous experience in my life, because it was harder than anything that I had ever dealt with. And just you know, all of the, the busyness and the dealing with, you know, insurance and doctors was minor compared to watching my daughter um, suffer the way that she did. And, and my daughter is not a, um, a complainer. She's a, a heroic being. She has a very strong spirituality. So when Heidi was in pain, I knew that it was serious and there was a tremendous amount of pain. Um, so she and I, uh, in 92, she was diagnosed in 89. In 92, we went to a conference on Buddhism called Buddhism in America in Boston. She had been doing pretty OK at the time. And in the middle of the night, the last night we were there, she had a horrendous bout of a flare up of her Crohn's disease. And we were about th at least three to four hours where she was laying on the floor in the bathroom, curled in a ball, and I just was joining her right there and trying to attune and see what she needed and not impose my agendas on her. And then eventually we were able to get to the bed and I was curled with her on the bed. And there were moments when I felt that I cannot do this one more second. This is unbearable. But I really feel like um, the being force or the divine, whatever you want to call it, you know, took over and helped me do this. So we were driving back on the plane and um, not driving back on the plane. <laughs> we were on the plane back to the Bay Area and Heidi's head was on my shoulder and she was asleep and I was exhausted. Her hair was wet and stringy from what she'd been going through. Closed my eyes to meditate. And I had this insight that I had grown and changed more from this four-year experience of walking through this with my daughter than I had from over 15 years of spiritual practice. And I thought, my God, this put me on a spiritual fast track. And then a list started to form in my mind of all the qualities that had come online for me through these years. And they were the same things that motivated me to do spiritual work in the beginning. I had become more compassionate. I had become more patient, more present. I became able to let go of control, because I had to. Control never worked. I learned how to surrender. I learned how to be with what is. I learned how to not be so judgmental about myself when I wasn't doing it perfectly. It was amazing. And then what happened was my perspective, just sitting there on the plane, shifted. And rather than just being identified with the true, difficult, dark side of what we'd been experiencing, I started seeing everything from a much bigger perspective. I saw that there was a meaning in this, that this was an initiation for me, that this was a soul event, that this is a transformational journey. And it changed me more than all the spiritual practices I'd been in. So it, it may sound like something small, but probably to a lot of you it's not, because I see these heads nodding, so I know you're getting it. Um, it was life-changing for me, 
absolutely life-changing. And it has never changed. And um, Heidi had, uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011 when she was in the fifth month of her pregnancy and had to go through an aggressive chemo while she was pregnant. Then after she had the baby, um, she had to have a double mastectomy and um, a hysterectomy. And she also had a child with Down syndrome um, a couple years before that. So I don't say that to get your sympathy, but to point to how in my life, I, I could never have imagined adversity to this degree. And so for someone like me who was having these experiences to shift from really seeing the gifts and the rewards and how this really was meant to be um, was remarkable. Um, and I keep bringing that into uh, going over to see the kids. And when the kids get sick, I just did two and a half years of caregiving with my mom who died last March. And um, I have never fallen back to simply being seeing myself as a victim. I just see that this is my destiny in this life. And this keeps cracking my ego and opening my heart and strengthening me. I, it's beyond me um, how magnificent the um, transformation has come from these most awful circumstances. And I know there are many, many other people on this planet who go through the same thing. And, and there's a tendency to either become so shut down and crushed by this, or there are many, many people who keep expanding and growing as a result of it. Thank, thank goodness, thank goodness. So I just wanted to share um, a few of the gifts that came up from other people, three in particular, because the list is a mile long. Um, who would be in my workshops, some of the things that people experienced that um, they saw as profound. And I'll read you a few little excerpts um, from these people's experiences. So one of them is um, the gift of not knowing, the gift of don't know mind, or living in the mystery. Our egoic mind, as we all know, needs to know, wants certainty, wants guarantees. And yet, that isn't even close to how life works. And so the gift of learning how to really surrender and live with and accept so many unanswered questions which caregiving is rife with is a soul gift. The ego hates it. The ego freaks out. The ego can't stand waiting for the results of a biopsy. The ego can't stand not knowing uh, what effect the latest pain med is going to have. The ego can't stand not knowing if this person is going to survive or not. The ego can't stand knowing what quality of life this person is going to have. And yet, all of you who've done any caregiving, and I, how many people have done family and or professional caregiving? Yeah, whoa, OK. So probably 90% of you. So you know how many times, how often we are challenged around this issue right here. So that when we learn how to really live in the moment and make peace with what can be a lot of discomfort, waiting for the results of a biopsy, for example, that could be torture. And I've seen many people just grip you know, sometimes for days or weeks, not being able to live in this time of uncertainty. And yet, when we can just face it, I don't know yet. 
Not only do I not know, but I don't have a clue what the outcome is going to be or how my care recipient is going to handle it. I don't know. And there's an incredible piece that happens to that. Incredible piece that happens when we can live in the not knowing. So I'd like to read something from someone named Rose. So Rose's daughter um, had breast cancer. I had an aha moment about a year ago, Rose said, that turned this around for me and has actually changed my life. I realize that there are no guarantees about anything. I don't know and cannot know, and no one will be able to tell me how long Stephanie, who's her daughter, will live. It's not up to me. There isn't one thing I can do to fix things so the cancer won't come back or to find out how any of this will turn out. I finally accepted the truth that this was beyond my control. With that realization came a flood of insights about how I'd been arguing with reality my entire life to avoid pain, disaster, and outcomes I simply never thought I could live with. I've been holding on to everything very tightly, desperately afraid of losing what was important to me, as if controlling myself and everything around me would keep misfortune at bay. Then somehow I let go. I told myself, and I knew it was true, that Stephanie's future was unknown. I cried a lot then. The things I had used to shield myself from this truth fell away. After that first cry, I felt like a new woman. I felt like a woman instead of a scared little girl who was always running for safety. I started to become more relaxed about everything. Instead of vigilantly walking through each day as if I were walking across a minefield, I saw that pain, loss, and hardship were inevitable, that they were a part of life, a part of every day, and that there was nothing I or anyone else could do to change that. I saw that what I could change were my reactions. I could continue to fight with reality or accept it. I'm no longer consumed by fear and anxiety about Stephanie. I appreciate every moment that she has and that we have together, but I don't hang on to those moments. I let them come and I let them go. So the second gift that I thought I would talk about a little bit that I've already alluded to somewhat is the great opportunity that we have when we're walking through adversity, really of any kind, we can apply it to what's true for a lot of us these days globally, um, which is that we are faced with a very beautiful opportunity to do shadow work. We are a feel-good culture. We always want it to be springtime. I think that that is the root of a lot of addictions for people because we have not been conditioned to um, be able to accept and relax with pain, physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain. And so um, here we have this adversity. And so we can either shut down, become cold, become reserved, back away from everything that we can so we don't have to feel, build walls, or what some people do is just jump to the light prematurely. It's gorgeous to eventually include the light, include the divine, because we will suffer enormously if we don't. But a lot of us, and I did in my earlier years, um, are light chasers. 
You know, when I opened up spiritually in the 70s, I just wanted to go to that ashram every day and chant for three hours a day and bow at the feet of the guru. And this is back in the 70s when it was very popular in the Bay Area. And I found out that um, I was uh, avoiding my humanness. And so here we have an opportunity to really face what may be very deep fear, deep-seated anger, frustration that is part and parcel of caregiving, especially if this is someone that you care about. So the dance becomes, how do we even see this truly as a gift that, oh my gosh, I can do shadow work now. Here's this awful thing going on. I can stop running away from my anger. I can stop deflecting from my fear. I can embrace the full domains of my humanness. And that doesn't mean I won't also be doing my spiritual work. But I'm sure you all know this from yourselves and people you know. How many of us are still walking around holding feelings at bay and the damaging consequences that has to our bodies so um, I'm going to read you another little short excerpt from Jerry. And now we'll talk about one more gift, Jerry. I guess I'm a more open-hearted man since my father's stroke, said Jerry. I do cry. Actually, I cry a lot. I guess that's a good thing for a guy who's always been the tough one. I was always so proud that I never let anything get to me. He wipes a tear from his eye. And then the last one I'm going to talk about um, has to do with love. And I, I love how much love has been talked about today, starting with Dean Ornish and Jane and... Um, I've, I've laughed for a long time about how in the whole field of psychology, how we use the word empathy so freely, and no one uses the word love. And I was just thrilled to hear everyone talking about love. Empathy is love. So, um, and I, I think that's probably obvious for many of you, if you think about your different difficult caregiving experiences and how, yes, your heart has been broken and you've probably experienced grief and sadness that you may never have before and that very broken heart and that openness actually also opens the heart so that we can love. And I have actually known very few people who, when you really look at what's happened to them um, in terms of the rewards of caregiving, that somehow or other it doesn't come around to love. You know, oh my God, I have kept so-and-so at bay for years and years, and now here I am day after day, watching this person suffer, and my heart's broken, and I care so much um, about this person and so want to help them. Because caregiving is service. You know, I consider myself honored and that it is a privilege that I have been able to um, help my daughter and my grandchildren and, and my mother. And I want to briefly say something about what happened around the topic of love with my mother who died this last March. And she was a person, she was the most difficult person in my life. I had done so much therapy <laughs> to try to dissolve the mother-daughter knot. My mother and I did therapy together back in the 70s or 80s or whenever it was. Um, and I did so much spiritual work about, you know, all kinds of things. But I always, I couldn't understand why this wouldn't open. And so I just had started to accept, I'm just going to have this knot in my being um, about my mother um, until she dies or I die or whatever. And then she became extremely ill about two and a half years ago. 
and um, with some debilitating health conditions, things that were extremely painful. She also started to have some cognitive problems, and she was depressed about how she was losing her life. She'd been very active and loved bridge, and more and more she could do less and less. And my heart broke, and I could not spend enough time there. Fortunately, she had long-term care, so we were able to have 24-7 caregivers, so I didn't have to take that whole thing on. But I still had to take on a lot, and I wanted to. I couldn't believe it. I would say to my husband, I actually want to go to mom's. I can't wait to get over there. And I was always looking for little things to bring her. And our hearts opened to each other in a way that I could not have imagined was possible in this lifetime. And the last at least nine or 10 months of her life, most of what we experienced in each other's presence was love, laughter at times, which was almost unheard of between the two of us, kindness, mutual respect. And it just, it blasted open my heart. So I, I think of my mother often these days as one of my best spiritual teachers because she taught me how to love. So um, I will share one more excerpt from Greg, who also experienced the heart-opening gift of caregiving. OK. So Greg said, I've been a selfish person for so much of my life, and my wife and brothers would agree. Having to be there now so completely for my brother Jack, who has a very painful bone cancer, has changed me. I actually feel better than I have for my entire life. And I know it's because I'm putting someone besides me first. It's all so strange. Here's this awful situation. Believe me, I feel horrible about it, especially with all the pain he's in. And I feel more fulfilled than ever before. So again, these are just a few of the possible rewards, benefits, gifts of doing caregiving. And I hope that some of these stories um, may shine some maybe new lights, new little possibilities for you. Um, and I just, I feel honored to be here with all of you. So thank you. So we have five minutes. And is there a comment or a question? And if not, we'll move on to the next person. Yes. Thank you so much. I um, was really moved by the story of your experience with your mother. And I wondered if there was anything in particular about it that you can identify of what happened there. Hmm. You, kind of like why that yeah. would have happened. Yeah. I it's... think um, for the first time in my life with my mother, I, ha I saw her completely vulnerable, mm -hmm. shattered, open, scared. And she let down her walls because she had to. And that was one of the main things, I think, that let me open my heart. And, and then, plus, I, I am um, a sensitive. And so um, I hurt when someone else, I'm an empath, as many of us are. We wouldn't even be in the healing arts. And so seeing her suffer so much the way my daughter did um, just broke my heart. And I wanted to do anything I could to help. Thank you. So thanks. Hi. I'm wondering, I, I noticed in the introduction that you're an integrative life coach. Mm -hmm. What role would you play or some other life coach play with helping someone with a chronic debilitating condition that goes year after year? So you, gotta, you have the, 
the person with the condition and you have a caregiver, mm -hmm. what, can, what role can the uh, uh, life coach play? Well, I help? very purposely do not work, I'm very careful who I work with. And because I don't feel like I have the proper training to work with someone who has a debilitating illness, I can't really respond to that question. But what I do is um, work with caregivers as well as other folks, um, particularly focused around self-care and helping them see what they can do so that they can better manage the whatever the range of experiences are that they're having in the caregiving role. And it's different for every person. But I really hone in on on that piece because in my experience, so many family caregivers relegate self-care to the very bottom of the list. And in my book, it's imperative and actually needs to be at the top of the list. So that's a place that I work with the caregivers. Okay, and I understand that, I understand that you don't do it, but would other life coaches oh. be able to help, not the caregiver, but the person who's suffering from the long-term I, I can't say that I know that. I mean, I, I have therapist friends who work with people with debilitating illnesses. Um, like pain management and things like that. Well, and also, you know, having a debilitating chronic illness is extremely stressful. People are often terrified if they're not used to letting themselves feel how afraid they are for example, or maybe how resentful they feel at a family member who wants to control everything, then there's a lot of emotional and spiritual work that can be done with the person who has the illness. Okay, thank so, you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you so much. thank you.